Today, we're continuing our teaching series called Triggered. Everyone say Triggered. Triggered. Starting the series called Triggered because we live in a time, I don't know if you've noticed, that's fairly anxious. Has anyone picked up on that a little bit? And maybe for some of you showing up today, you're showing up in this space today, and and if you're honest, you're feeling a weight of anxiety, a a weight of fear, uh, because of this election that is about to take place in a couple of days. And for some of us, maybe your anxiety, anxiety is really high. Maybe for others of you, it's, it's more of a low-grade anxiety. But I'm just going to bet that all of us on some level, in some way, shape, or form, you're feeling some friction and some tension regarding the week that we're heading into. And so I've really just been praying this week, God, what do you want me to say? What makes sense in this moment that we find ourselves in just a couple days before um, we enter into what has already been a very contentious election? What, what, what do you want to say to us? And I just felt like God gave me this message. And if you're taking notes today, it's the one idea, if you remember anything, remember this. This idea that God put on my heart is this. It's so simple. It is this, that worry doesn't have to win. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, worry doesn't have to win? And I think that's not only true for the week that we're entering, that worry doesn't have to win, but I also think it's true in your marriage. I think it's true in your finances. I think it's true in your career. I think it's true in your mental health, in your faith. I believe with everything that's in me, and I'm going to do everything in my power today to convince you that worry doesn't have to win in your life. I'm not saying there's nothing to worry about. There are some things to worry about, things to take seriously. But what I am saying is that even in a world where there is so much to worry about, you have the power to choose, to decide today that you're not going to let worry win. And I don't know about you, but I think life is too short and too much of a gift to allow worry to win. Can I get an amen on that? Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Today, God, would you speak through me because nobody in this room needs to hear from me. We need to hear from you. So speak through me, speak to every one of our lives in every place that we find ourselves in right now. And God, for those of us who are in this room and we are just, we we are weary carrying the weight of worry in our lives. God, I pray that today would be a day that that worry would be lifted and that God, that burden would be lightened and that we would just see and feel and experience this sense of peace in our hearts, a peace that, that goes beyond comprehension, beyond understanding a peace that could only come from you. We, we need your peace during these anxious times so that worry doesn't win. We love you so much. And God, we also thank you for a warrior's win last night. We pray that you would touch Steph Curry's ankle. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. 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 So I want to read a couple passages from Jesus in John chapter 14 and then John chapter 16. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Doesn't Jesus make it sound so easy? (laughs) Don't be troubled and don't be afraid. It's simple to understand, but hard to live out. But then in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus, he says, I have told you these things so that in me, everyone say, in Jesus. In Jesus. in Jesus, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. What, what I found so interesting about these two passages in particular is that Jesus tells his disciples something that sounds like, on the surface at least, that they completely contradict. Jesus says, you're going to have troubles in this life, but don't be troubled. <laughs> Jesus says, you're going to have troubles in this life. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be surprised about it. You're going to have troubles in this life, but here's the good news. You don't have to be troubled. And that's what I want to talk about today. How can we show up in a world full of troubles and not allow ourselves, as Jesus seems to believe is possible, to be troubled? Jesus seems to believe that there is a version of life where you can live in a world full of anxiety and yet still be grounded in your peace. That you can have a peace that is unshakable in the midst of a volatile world. But how in the world do we we get there? And in John chapter 14 and 16, Jesus simply, he tells us that that there are two things that steal our peace most often. There are two enemies to the peace within. And Jesus makes it clear that 
If we're going to have peace, we're going to have to find victory over these enemies. And what are those two enemies? Those two enemies that disrupt our peace the most are worry and fear. Can you imagine how much different your life would be if the things you've been constantly worried about, you weren't worried about? Or, or how differently your life would be, how differently you would be able to show up in the world if you didn't fear all of the times, the things that you have been fearing? See, worry and fear project a negative view of the world around us. And worry and fear project really a negative future. I would even argue that worry and fear is an act of faith because it's a deep-seated belief in the worst-case scenario. And the irony about worry and fear is that worry and fear is not rooted in a present reality. It's only rooted in a future possibility. And yet, even though worry and fear is rooted in a future possibility, it has the ability to disrupt our present reality. It can take away our life in the here and now as we worry about what might happen in the then and the there. I've heard it said before that worry is like temporary atheism because worry is imagining a future where God is not in control. It's imagining and living in a future where God is not on the throne. And, and maybe that is why Jesus multiple times says, you're going to have troubles, but don't be troubled. He, he says, you're going to have troubles, but take heart because I have already overcome the world. I have already overcome the battles that you have faced. See, what Jesus seems to believe and wants us to believe is that God has already worked out what you're worried about. That whatever it is you're worrying about, God has already worked out. Take heart. You're going to have troubles, but don't be troubled because I've overcome the world. In other words, Jesus says, whatever you're worried about, God has already worked out. And what that means is such good news for all of us. And that is that worry doesn't have to win. Worry doesn't have to win. You might be worried about your job. And I'm not saying that those worries aren't valid or legitimate, but I am telling you today that you can decide that worry isn't going to win. You could be worried about your finances. And I'm not saying that the, 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 the bottom line is not looking great. Maybe it's not. But what I am saying is that worry doesn't have to win. Maybe you're worried about your marriage and maybe you have a lot of reasons to be worried about your marriage, but I'm telling you this right now that if you will show up and do what you can do, God will do what you cannot do and you'll find out that everything you've been worried about, God has already worked out and I wish I could get an amen from somebody right now. Somebody that believes that God really is as great and as good as he says he is, that whatever you're worried about, this God is ahead of you. He's not improvising your life. There's never a moment that you're going to walk through where God's like, whoa, didn't see that coming. Like, like God is in control. He is ahead of you and he has worked out what you are worried about. See, today's message isn't me standing up here and saying, don't worry. No, there's lots of things to be worried about. But what I am saying is that that worry, as real as it might be, it doesn't have to win. How much freer would your life be if you chose not to let worry win? I don't know about you. There'd be a lot of moments where I would get my life back because I did not allow worry to win because I believe that God has worked out what I'm already, God has worked out what I'm worried about. Now, if you're going to believe this, though, you got to anchor to something. You can't just anchor yourself to a, a catchy little statement like worry, you, you know, don't let worry win. You actually need to ground yourself in something deeper. And I want to give you a couple of reasons why worry doesn't have to win. And they're not my reasons. They're, they're not cultural reasons. They are reasons that I believe are theologically robust and grounded in the character of who God is. So that the next time that worry tries to woo your life away from you and take your peace from you, that you can decide, I'm going to cling to these truths about God, and I'm going to ground myself in the character of God, knowing that God will always live up to his reputation. God will always live up to his character. Now, I've spent hundreds of hours studying theology. I've read hundreds of books on theology. I've spent thousands of dollars going to seminary to train to, to do what I do. And, and I want to tell you, eventually, everything that I need to know about God, I learned in a short prayer that a lot of people pray before they eat dinner together. And maybe you've prayed this prayer, but it's, it's super simple and super sure. It is, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for this food. Can I get an amen for short dinner prayers? <laughs> Come on. Some of y'all pray so long before we eat. I ain't got no time for that. Hurry up. But God is great. God is good. And we thank him for this food. 
How does that teach us everything that there is to know about the character of God? Well, first you got to ignore the food part. Then you got to ignore like good and food don't, don't actually rhyme at all. And then you get to the, the, the meat of it that matter most. And that is that God is great. And God is good. Can we just say that out loud? God is great. And God is good. One more time. God is great. And God is good. Y'all are a bunch of theologians now. Because you just quoted the two characteristics that everything there is to know about God will come back to. Everything you could ever learn, know, or experience about God will come back to one of these two realities about the character of God. That God is great and God is good. But the problem is, if you're anything like me, I don't always believe both of those things at the same time. How about you? Like there's moments in my life I don't believe either. Can we be real? And there's probably moments you don't believe either. But then there's moments that happen more frequently, and that is I believe one over the other. That I believe that God is great, but not very good. Or I believe that God is good, but I don't really think God is great. And if you're going to anchor yourself in an anxious world to a peace that transcends understanding, you're going to have to anchor yourself not to one, but both realities of the character of God. That God is great or God is good. Because here's the deal. If you believe that God is good, but not great, You'll like God, you'll appreciate, you'll believe that God has good intentions for your life, but you'll never trust God with your life because while he might have good intentions, you don't really believe God is great and have the power to turn those intentions into a reality. Or for others of us, and I found this to be common with those who are raised maybe in a more fundamentalist, legalistic church background, you tend to believe that God is good, but, or God is great, but not very good. And the issue with a God who's great but not good is that you might believe that God can do whatever he wants to, but that's terrifying because you don't actually think God is very good. And you don't actually believe that God has good intentions for your life. And so when you believe that God is great but not good, you typically will not surrender to that God. You'll run from that God because you believe he has all the power and none of the goodness. But if we're going to anchor ourselves in an anxious world to a peace that goes beyond understanding, a peace that is unshakable, We have to anchor ourselves to the reality that God is both great and God is good. And God is as great as he says he is and as good as he says he is. In fact, this is what the early church in the first century had to learn. If they were going to not lose sight of who God has called them to be and the purposes God had called them into in the first century. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, Peter, he is writing a letter to these new followers of Jesus. And and sometimes when we read these letters, we we don't read it in the context from which it was written. So we miss the intensity of the letter that Peter wrote. And you need to understand in 1 Peter, Peter is not writing to a a group of Christians where everything's going right, their uh, hope is at an all-time high, they have a ton of reasons to feel optimistic. In fact, Peter was writing to them when life and the world around them was the exact opposite of what I just described. The early followers of Jesus found themselves being persecuted for their faith in Rome. And as a result of their persecution, now these first century followers of Jesus are scattered everywhere. And as a result of them being scattered and their suffering because of the corruption of Caesar and the systems of the day, the the early church found themselves looking at the world around them, a world of hostility and anxiety and wondering, is this all going to work out okay? Has anyone else thought that? They're looking around at the world going, is everything going to work out? We thought God was in control, but it sure seems like God is out of control right now. What are we supposed to do? And that's where the book 1 Peter comes from. 1 Peter is not a fireside kumbaya chat with a bunch of peaceful followers of Jesus. It is an urgent letter to followers of Jesus who find themselves in a time of crisis, fear, and anxiety about the future and the world around them. And what's interesting is that Peter doesn't write down 10 things they should start doing today. He just gives them two things they need to remember every day. And he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, here's what Peter says to these anxious followers of Jesus, scared about the world unfolding around them, He says this, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. What does Peter do? 
In the midst of trials and turmoil and tension, Paul or Peter speaks to these first century followers of Jesus, wondering if God has lost control of the world. And he says, you need to remember this, that God is great. That if you'll humble yourself and come underneath the mighty hand of God, this God is so great, he will lift you up in due time. But God's not only great, Paul, Peter says, he says, God is good. And you can bring your worries and your cares to this God, and this God is not going to scold you or shame you or go like, why don't you believe in me? Why don't you have enough faith? But this God will meet you with kindness and love. Why? Because Peter says, God is so good that he cares about you. And so maybe you came today thinking I was going to give a sermon about, you know, what Jesus thinks about the people on the right or what Jesus thinks about people on the left. You are going to be so disappointed because today I just want to keep the main thing the main thing. And I want to anchor myself to God because in a couple days, no matter who gets elected, I do know this, Jesus is still on the throne. No matter who gets elected, Jesus is still king. And our pledge of allegiance, first and foremost, is to the kingdom of heaven. And we're called to be citizens of that kingdom here in a world of hostility. So how does that look in real life? Let me give you the first reason. The first reason why worry doesn't have to win is because if God is great, then that means this, God is in control. If God is great then God is in control. Peter, again, he says, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. In other words, Peter says, if God is great, then worry doesn't have to win because God is in control. By a quick show of hands, who here is comforted by the idea of God being in control? Go ahead and raise your hand if that kind of comforts you a little bit. So I anticipated most hands would come up, which is going to make the next part of this message a little awkward. As many of us who say, I am so comforted by God being in control, I'm not entirely positive you are as confident in God being in control as you say you are. Let's be honest. Does it really comfort you to know that God is in control? Is it really a good thing? Do you find it nice to know that, hey, I don't need to be in control. I don't need to figure everything else out. God's in control. And the reason I'm pushing back on this is because ever since you were a little kid and had a little bit of an independence form in your mind, you have been doing everything you can to get control back. How do you know? Travis, I've raised a seven-year-old girl. And this girl tells me every time I tell her it's time to go to bed, she always goes, when I grow up, I'm going to go to bed when I want to go to bed. <laughs> See, ever since we were a little kid, you were doing the same thing, right? Mom and dad, go to bed. Man, when I grow up that day, I'm going to go to bed when I want to go to bed. I'm going to wake up when I want to wake up. I'm going to wear what I want to wear. And you know what? You tell me what to eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm going to eat what I want to eat. I'm going to have Skittles every single meal, mom and dad. I'm going to taste the rainbow every day. <laughs> Right? Like ever since we were a little kid, we have been doing everything we can to find and seize control for our lives. And let's not act like that just goes away when we become adults. Right? Like we just kind of get a little bit more, we're just better about it. <laughs> but we still want control. We still long for control. How is it comforting to say that God is in control when you have been on a quest for maximum control? I've been thinking this week, do we want God to be in control or do we just want God to take control? Because there's a difference. Most don't want God to be in control totally. But when they say they want God to be in control, what they're saying is, I want God to be in control temporarily. I don't want God to be in control totally. That's a little too much. I like driving too much. I like leading too much. But you know what I am here for? I'm all about God taking control temporarily. God, you can take control in my life on Sunday, but God, something else is going to take control on Friday. God, God, God I, I want you to take control of my marriage. God, take control of my marriage. In fact, take control of my spouse because I'm pretty sure they are demon possessed right now. But you know, God, don't take control of me. Don't change me. Change them. They're the problem, God. Don't you see? Don't change me. You know, God, um, man, God, take control of my finances. Take control of my finances because you know your boy needs a raise. But you know what? Don't, 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 don't. God, don't tell me how to spend my money. Don't tell me how to steward those, uh, my finances. God, I want you to take control of our country. Take control of who's in the White House. But God, don't tell me to love my neighbor or my uh, enemy who voted for you know who. 
Like, no, 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 no. Let me decide what's best there. But, but God, take control of our country. You see, if we're honest, and I'm part of this, if I'm really, really honest, as much as I wish I could stand up here and be like, I always want God to take total control. That's not always the case. In fact, a lot of times, I prefer him just to do it temporarily until I'm ready to take control back. That like Carrie Underwood, we'll give Jesus the wheel, right? Jesus, take the wheel. But we don't get him of them the GPS or the gas pedal. Right? Some of us, man, we need to follow Jesus like we drive in a Waymo. Right? We need to just let the Waymo take you where you need to go. You know, but for many of us, myself included, it's like, I'll give you the wheel, but I'm reaching over as long as I can to try and get the gas pedal, hit the GPS. What does it look like to trust God fully and completely? See, Peter, he's saying, if we're going to have peace during these crazy times, he's like, we're going to humble ourselves. Isn't it interesting? He didn't just say, like, God is great and he'll lift you up in due time. But he actually starts by saying, you need to humble yourself, meaning this isn't going to come naturally, meaning this is going to be really, really, really hard. And it's going to require you to humble yourself and admit something, that there is a God and you're not it. That God is a better driver of your life than you are. And that's easy to say on a Sunday morning in a church, but are we saying it Monday morning? I find it interesting that on Sunday mornings all around the world, Christians are saying that they believe that Jesus can save them from their sin, but by Monday, they don't believe that Jesus can save them from their situation. Because it's so easy in this place to say, I give you control, but on Monday, will you? On Tuesday, depending on the election, where it goes or where it doesn't go, will you still trust that God is in control? Because it's going to take a lot of humility and surrender. In fact, can I give you a little bit of image? Jenna, can I use you for a second? Can you come up here real quick? Can we all give it up for Jenna? Give her some love. Now, we've been, we've been married 18 years. It's pretty cool we got married when we were 12. So, um, got mar married 18 years. You trust me, hopefully, by now. Okay. That, would, that didn't sell me. All right. But you trust me enough for this. So, I have to turn you around. Can I you put your hands on the side and your legs together like that? You're doing great. So, Hopefully this works out. Um, so what, what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do, Jenna, is, uh, is I'm going to, when I say go, or not when I go, when I start pulling you back, I'm just going to lean you back, and, and, and you're just going to need to trust me. The one thing I, I need you to not do, please don't do, is flail your arms around and freak out, okay? So I just need you to stay stiff as a board right now. Can we show Jenna some love and encouragement right now? Come on. See, it's easy to say you trust me yeah. right now yeah. when you're standing up on your feet, when you could run away right now and get out of here. But, but it's a whole nother thing to trust me when I start leaning you back and, <laughs> and you can't move and you start losing your balance and your feet start coming off the ground. It's a whole nother thing to try. Do you trust me now, Jenna? See, it's easy to trust me when you're in control, but do you trust me when you're not in control anymore? Do you trust that my strength is enough, that I'm not going to let you fall? And see, I need you to get this image in your head and then to your heart, sear it into your soul, because this is what faith looks like most often. It's easy on Sunday morning when you're standing tall and life is going good and everything's going according to plan to say, God, I want you to be in control, but do you want God to be in control and trust God to be in control when life brings you back? It's easy to trust God up here. Do you trust him back here? Do you trust him back here? And that's why in the Proverbs in chapter 3, Proverbs 3, it says, I trust the Lord with my heart and I lean not on my own understanding. I lean when it seems bleak and hopeless. I lean not on my understanding, but on your strength. Can we give Jenna a round of applause? See, it was so important to understand, what's so critical to understand is that in those moments where you're completely out of control and everything seems to be out of control, you are in the best position to see what God's strength can really do. When it feels like nothing's going according to plan and the world is falling apart around you and you're just falling backwards and you're just like, dear God, I hope you don't let me fall completely. I know it. It sucks and we wish it wasn't this way, but it's like in that space that you find out God's hand was behind you the entire time. 
and his strength was lifting you up in due time. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, fall into Jesus. I feel like if I could sum up what my faith journey has been, and I don't think I'm an exception, I think my faith journey is every day deciding to fall into Jesus, to fall into his strength and trust that if this God is great, as great as the first century followers of Jesus believed, as great as God said about himself, then this God in his greatness and strength will not let you fall. He will lift you up in due time. See, we got to break a misconception about peace. A lot of us think that peace is achieved when we're finally in control. But that's an illusion, isn't it? This idea that I'll have peace when I'm in control. But the funny thing is when you get in control, you're scared about losing that control. So there goes your peace. See, peace isn't about getting in control. But you actually achieve true peace when you no longer need control. When you get to this place where you say, God, I don't need to know all the answers. I don't need to know how this is all going to pan out. I don't even need to know necessarily how the whole staircase looks, but I'm just going to take the next step and trust that you have the rest. See, Peter says that God is great, which means God is in control, but he also affirms them and calls them to remember this, that God is good. And if God is good, then that means worry doesn't have to win because it means that God cares about you. For, for, for some of you, Maybe it's not hard to imagine that there's this almighty God who's in control, this infinite God who's in control. But what is hard for you is to believe that there's an intimate God that cares about your deepest needs. I don't know about you. I've actually had not a lot of struggle believing in the greatness of God, but I have struggled immensely believing in the goodness of God. I have at times struggled to believe that God actually knows me, cares about me, or at least cares about the details of my life. And I've found those moments when I no longer trust God's goodness, I I begin to seize control again in my life because somehow in my head I've convinced myself I'm actually better than God is, that I have better plans than God. And can I just give you some wisdom from my own experience of life? Um, That doesn't work out well. Like there's something powerful and freeing when you just go, God is good. He truly cares about me. And, and notice Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, he, he doesn't say, give your cares to God and God will fix it. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, give your cares to God and God will fix it. And I think this is a misconception in churches. And I've seen a lot of uh, followers of Jesus who were raised in the church throw their faith away because they were given a faith that was alive from the get-go. And that version of faith was that if you follow Jesus, your life will get better all the time. Then if you're just faithful, you go to church, you give, you sing. And when the pastor says amen, you say amen back. If you do that, then your life will be easy, breezy, beautiful, cover girl. It will be awesome. It'll be awesome. And, and who here has been following Jesus and knows that life isn't always easy when you follow Jesus? In fact, sometimes when you follow Jesus, life isn't easy, not because you're not following Jesus. Life isn't easy because you're following Jesus. Because it's a battle at times to follow Jesus. I want to give you a realistic and uh, understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. When you follow Jesus, the scriptures do not promise that Jesus makes your life better. But it does promise that Jesus makes you better at life. It, it, he, Jesus makes you better at life. He equips you and empowers you to show up in this world as broken and messy as it is. And he gives you what you need, not just to endure, but to rise above it. See, that's what Peter says here. He doesn't say God will just fix everything if you bring your cares to him. And I'll be honest, I, I'm kind of glad because a God who fixes things but doesn't care about you, would you rather have that? Or a God who cares and walks with you through the ups and downs of life? I don't know about you, but when I'm in pain, I don't need someone who will show up and uh, give me all the answers. Isn't that annoying? When you're hurting and someone's like, let me tell you why you're hurting. Let me tell you how to get out of it. Or you're struggling and someone brings a 10-point PowerPoint presentation to you on, on how you're just missing it and how, you know, fear is false evidence appearing real. And they have all these, like, gimmicky things that they say to you to try and uplift you, but it really just, ugh, it feels wrong. Like, you know what you need? It's probably what I need. 
is that person, that friend that will show up and sometimes they just sit with you. Sometimes they, they, they just join you in the mud. Sometimes they cry with you. They hear you yell. They see you slam your fist on the table and they don't judge you for maybe not having a, your best moment. We need those kind of friends in our life. And so I think that's like what Peter's saying. He's saying, if you bring your cares to God, he cares about you. In other words, what Peter is telling us is that when you bring your cares to God, you will find in God a friend that you always wish you had. That you will find a friend in God that is like the friend that you always, always wish you had. But the truth is, I'm not sure how much we, we really believe that God cares about us because I'm convinced if we truly believe that God cares about us as much as God says he cares about us, we would worry less about the things that we worry about because we would look at our life and we would go, I got an almighty ally. I got God on my side, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the cosmos into existence with the words of his mouth. That God is in my corner. He's with me. He's for me. He cares about me and he is leading me forward. I'm not saying there's nothing to worry about, but I'm saying when you trust that God is both great and good, that worry, it doesn't have to win. It doesn't have to win because you serve a God who is so great that he is in control. And you serve a God who is so good that when you go to bed tonight, you can know that you have an almighty ally who cares deeply about the things that you care about. You're troubled. You're tr you have troubles, but you don't need to be troubled. Why? Because God is great and God is good. Can the worship team come to the stage? I want to I wanna read the words of Paul. And, and sometimes I think we, we think Paul, he writes sometimes his words from like the luxury of a hammock, you know, and he's just eating grapes, talking about how good God is. And, but you need to understand like when Paul was beaten, he was arrested, he was imprisoned, he was abandoned. Paul would eventually actually be crucified upside down and he would be crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy of dying in the same manner of his Lord and King Jesus. And I tell you all that because I want you to hear what he says next. Because you might be thinking like I've thought when I look at the life of Paul and I, and I ask, how did he do it? I don't know about you. I don't know how I would do if I was beaten, imprisoned, abandoned, shipwrecked, abused, um, and then crucified. I don't know if I could stand up here and be like, and the entire time I just believed in the greatness and goodness of God. And so I don't know about you, I wanna learn from someone who did do that, who died believing that God was as great as God said he was and as good as God said he was. And here's what this man Paul says. And perhaps it's a message for all of us as we enter into this week, whether or not the worry you feel is from the election or whether it's from just life. I want you to hear the words of Paul today as if Paul is talking to you. In Romans chapter eight, Paul says this. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? I mean, that one line right there, can you imagine if you faced every worry with that sort of confidence? If God is on my side, this great and good God is on my side, how can I lose? Paul, he says, if God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? It's like God, Paul's saying is, do you need more evidence? Is the sacrifice of Jesus not enough? The resurrection of Jesus not enough? The, the sacrifice of Jesus shows us that God cares about us, that he's good. And the resurrection of Jesus shows us that God is great. The death didn't get the final word. He rose above it. So Paul's like, is there anything else God can do to prove to you how much he cares about you and how great he is? And he says, and who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. 
They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. But none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I need you to see that he grounded himself in the love of Jesus. What about your life would change if everything about your life was grounded in that this great and good God loves you as well? And then he says, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Man, you could just get the sense that Paul's like slamming his fists on the table, just going like, do you get it? Do you see that God is great? Do you see that God is good? Because when you trust that God is great and God is good, what Paul is saying, he's like, there is literally nothing that will get in the way of what God wants to do in your life. There is no worry, no fear, no struggle, no battle that is too great for the love and power of God. Paul is saying, do you get it? Because when you get it, you become unshakable and unstoppable. So that's what I'm inviting you to cling to this week. As we go out, we vote, we see what happens. May we remember that no matter what happens, two things are true. God is great. And that means he's in control. And God is good. And that means he cares for us. God is great. And God is good. And he has worked out what you're worried about, which means this, such good news. Worry doesn't have to win.